TV7 Israel News is made possible thanks to your generous donations. Shalom and good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem and in today's top stories. A deadly terror attack plagued the central city of Tel Aviv yesterday evening in a fifth such murderous act directed at Israelis in less than two weeks. Four U.S. service members sustained minor injuries in a rocket attack that emanated from an area under control of Iran proxy militias. U.S. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, voices opposition to the revocation of the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps from Washington's list of designated foreign terrorist organizations. A deadly terror attack plagued the central city of Tel Aviv yesterday evening, a fifth such murderous act in less than two weeks. The terrorist was seen walking next to a local pub and after sitting on an adjacent bench, drew a pistol and opened fire in every direction before successfully fleeing the scene. מאחר בנורא נורו מספר רב של יריות לכיוון אנשים שישבו בפאב, לצערי הרב יש לנו גם כן נפגעים. סך הכל באירוע הזה יש נכון לעכשיו כ-15 נפגעים, רובם ברמות פציעה קלות, אך לצערי הרב גם ישנם שני הרוגים ומספר פצועים נוספים מירי. עם קבלת האירוע הגיעו למקום כוחות משטרה רבים מאוד, התחילו לסגור את הזירה. הזירה היא זירה מורכבת, כי היא לא רק הזירה שנמצאת לפניכם, אלא זירה נוספת שנמצאת במעגלים נוספים. היות והיורה נעלם מהזירה וברח כנראה לכיוון אחד הסמטאות באזור. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, who together with Defense Minister Benny Gantz and Internal Security Minister Omer Barlev, oversaw the handling of the heinous act of terror, sent his deepest condolences to the families of those who were murdered and said he is praying for the complete recovery of the wounded. Premier Bennett went on to pledge, quote, wherever the terrorist is, we will get him, and everyone who helped him indirectly or directly will pay a price. Subsequently, shortly before 5.30 a.m. this morning, Intelligence units located the terrorist and Israeli Special Operations Unit engaged the target. And following a short gun battle, the terrorist was successfully neutralized, bringing an end to the comprehensive manhunt. Thankfully, no injuries were reported among the Israeli troops. Turning to Israel's northern neighbor, Syria, where the Green Village, which houses U.S.-led coalition forces of the Combined Joint Task Force for Operation Inherent Resolve, came under fire during the early hours of yesterday morning. According to Operation Inherent Resolve Public Affairs Office, coalition forces at Green Village in eastern Syria received two rounds of indirect fire that struck two support buildings, Consequently, four U.S. service members were in need of medical attention after sustaining minor injuries and possible traumatic brain injuries. And while the incident is under investigation, TV7 was informed that the fire emanated from an area near al mayadin where the Syrian Army's 5th Corps is stationed and which has been repeatedly utilized by Iranian proxy militias in the past to store weapons and launch attacks against U.S. and SDF forces. Separately, overnight in Iraq, two unmanned aerial systems were intercepted by Iraqi air defenses in the vicinity of the Ain al-Assad Air Force Base, which houses U.S.-led coalition troops. While no group had yet claimed responsibility for this attack, the methodology of the incident is identical to past aerial strikes, by such systems that were perpetrated by Iranian proxies in the region. Turning to the United States Capitol, where Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General Mark Milley provided testimony to the U.S. Senate Committee on Armed Services on the Department of Defense budget posture and review of the defense authorization request for fiscal year 2023, 
during which a line of questioning was relayed on whether concerns were voiced from allies and partners in the Middle East regarding the diminishing presence of U.S. forces in the region. Well, there is concern in the CENTCOM area of operations about what the result will be in terms of the footprint in CENTCOM, um, and we are continuing to work with our allies and partners to make sure it's appropriate to the level of threat. We clearly recognize uh, the terrorist threat, uh, both the residual threat in Afghanistan, but also throughout the region. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we think that we do have over-the-horizon capabilities, which we can discuss in classified session, uh, but we do think we're effective in being able to uh, find, fix, and, and when necessary, uh, strike any potential threat to the homeland. Secretary Austin and General Milley, both of whom have formerly served as commanders of CENTCOM, were subsequently asked on their personal opinions regarding whether the United States should respond favorably to the Iranian demand to remove the RGC from the U.S. Foreign Terrorist Organization's list in exchange for the revival of the 2015 nuclear agreement. The JCPOA consideration, one of the big red line debates right now, is for us to agree, us the United States, to delist the IRGC as an organization that sponsors terrorism. The Iranians want it. You gentlemen, unfortunately, and have led troops some of our finest, over 2,000 wounded and killed uh, by the Quds Force, IRGC, with the weapons they supplied to Iraqi Shia militias. I'm sure hundreds under your command were killed or wounded. Uh, the IRGC has recently been responsible for missile attacks in coordination with the Houthis against UAE civilians, our long-standing ally in the region, UAE. Is there any universe in which the two of you could say, you support the delisting of this terrorist organization with blood of American soldiers on its hands recently and delist them as the state sponsor of terrorism because Iran wants it. So what do you two, in your personal opinion, given how much experience you have with Iran in the Middle East, believe on that question? Uh, Senator, I respectfully, I, I won't comment on uh on negotiations that are ongoing and, and, and uh, speculate on what my, uh, my advice to the president is going to be. So in my personal opinion, uh, I believe the IRGC Coups Force to be a terrorist organization and I do not support them being delisted from the foreign terrorist organization. Thank you for your honesty. Another question related to General Milley included reports on deepening frustration by the leadership in the United Arab Emirates toward the Biden administration which evidently boiled over in recent weeks. And it has been reported that the Emiratis won't uh, accept the president's phone calls. Are you able to visit with your counterparts in the UAE? I have not had any issue contacting counterparts in the Middle East. It is worth mentioning the tensions between the Biden administration and Gulf Arab states, including Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates in particular, have been brewing for months. Alongside Washington's drastic shift in policy toward Iran, including vis-a-vis -vis its Yemenite Houthi proxy, the Biden administration uncompromising approach toward the so-called climate change collided with the fact that Washington's regional partners happen to be among the largest oil producers globally. However, once Western sanctions on Russia created a significant energy shortage worldwide, the United States contrastingly opted to pressure Riyadh and Abu Dhabi to increase their oil output, a shift of tone that has been received with cynicism. I think in COP26, the, all of the producers felt that they are uh, uninvited and unwanted and felt like they are in a corner. But now... We are on stage and they want us to produce more, so we are, again, the superheroes. It's not going to work like in, in like a span of a year. So we need to be wise, and I think we need wisdom here. We need to be uh, long-term planners. The remarks by the Emirati Energy Minister were made on March 28th, which was the same day Israel hosted the Negev Summit which included U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Emirati Minister of Foreign Affairs Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed, alongside their counterparts from Bahrain, Egypt and Morocco. 
And while discussions primarily focused on economic cooperation and the need to cooperate on confronting Iran's malign activities throughout the region, the multilateral summit also provided a platform to try and mend the fences between the United States and the United Arab Emirates. The meeting in the southern Israeli community of Sdebokil evidently yielded some fruit. This became apparent after Washington's top diplomat traveled to Morocco, where he met with the Emirati Crown Prince, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan. The UAE is a leader in the region, increasingly a leader in the world. And the many things that we are uh, trying to do, uh, including for our own people around the world, are going to be much more effective if they're doing them together with you. It is important to note that while the United Arab Emirates constitutes the largest trading partner of the United States throughout the Middle East and has long regarded Washington as the partner of choice, the recent squabble drove it to adopt a more pragmatic approach, similar to the Egyptian move of not laying all of its diplomatic eggs, so to speak, in one basket, that after the Obama administration alienated Cairo over its human rights track record, which seemingly emanated from an Egyptian struggle against the Muslim Brotherhood. Thank you for watching us. As part of TV7 Israel's Daily Prayer Initiative, I would like to encourage you to persist in prayer for the situation involving Russia and Ukraine, for their people's salvation and peace, alongside prayers for our persecuted brothers and sisters worldwide, in addition to our ongoing prayers for the peace of Jerusalem and the salvation of Israel. I'm Jonathan Hassan, wishing you a Shabbat Shalom and we will see you again on Monday at the same time.